In this edition of Southern Newsweek, a new form of golf played with a frisbee disc takes off in Invercargill. A plague of rabbits take over the town of Moeraki. And Year 11 pupils at Tyree College create a silent film. Hello and welcome to Southern Newsweek, I'm Melissa Barton. Invercargill has joined the disc golf community by launching its own 18 basket course. The development is one more step forward for a sport that first came to New Zealand in the 1990s. Sharon Rees has more. Disc golf national champion Martin Conway makes the sport look simple. But those attempting it for the first time at Invercargill's Queen's Park at the weekend soon found out it's not as easy as it looks. Conway's parents both played the sport at university and he says he picked it up from an early age. Since before I can remember I've been throwing discs so, and I've, I've started entering tournaments from when I was 14 or 15 and ended up winning a couple of New Zealand <laughs> junior titles which, um, which is pretty cool. When he realised there were people in Invercargill keen on the sport, Conway said he sought help from various organisations to establish a course in the city. Um, just kind of managed to to figure out that there's actually more than one person in, in Invercargill that's keen on playing. Um, so we, through that, got together and then um, approached um, a few different area, uh, outfits like the, the Youth Council and Happy Families to try and help us push it through and yeah, it kind of went from there. He says disc golf can be played by people of all ages and abilities as a fun day out or as a serious competition, which is helping to grow its popularity around the world. It's very much developing in New Zealand, so there's, there's a core group of about 50 odd people that travel around and go to the tournaments around the country. Um, but you do get people from the top of the north coming down to um, tournaments in the bottom of the south um, kind of thing. So um, very much developing, but it, like if you go to the States there's, there's more disc golf courses than, than stick golf courses, regular golf courses. Um, and it's, it's massive, yeah. So one of the fastest growing sports in the world. The launch gave people a chance to test their abilities with both short and long range targets and disc golf members to help them along. The 18 basket course is scattered throughout the less frequented areas of Queen's Park with the first basket at the Herbert Street entrance. Sharon Rees, The South Today. A computer animation company based in Dunedin has created a video of what the new America's Cup racing yachts will look like. The South Today found out more. The next America's Cup race will probably feature yachts that look like this. Gone are the catamarans with a hydrofoil on each hull, and instead we are back to a single hull equipped with an articulated hydrofoil jutting out on each side. Dunedin-based computer animation company Animation Research was commissioned to create a visualisation from the boat's blueprints, which they did in a mere three weeks. Animator Ken Gorry said it was an interesting challenge to convert the supplied data into a 3D model. What we do is take data, in this case from the people at the America's Cup outfit in Auckland, and, and make it visible, make it easily understandable. Like what we've got um, things like rows of number, columns of numbers for how the boat sailed, and we made that into the motion of the boat. I mean, it, it, all the information is there, but it just might, puts it in a package that's nice and easy to understand because um, it's not clear, columns of data aren't that clear and you know we had models of the boat so now that they see what the boat looks like with the sunlight on it on the water makes a big difference then you suddenly see that it's oh it's a real boat. Animation research still includes original team members such as Paul Sharp who created the original America's Cup graphics for television back in 1992 and Gorry says that Team New Zealand manager Grant Dalton is very happy with the animations the company continues to make. We got a message from Grant Dalton recently saying that he was really pleased with what we've done and he looks forward to working with us for the Cup. With the boats intended to go well over 80 kilometres per hour, it is unclear what chaos would occur if two boats came too close together, or what would happen to a sailor who fell off the prow and into the path of one of the hydrofoils at speed. Rudy Adrian, The South Today. Rabbit numbers have reached plague proportions at Moeraki. Residents who can't shoot the pests in built-up areas are looking forward to the release of a new rabbit-killing virus. Moeraki is crawling with rabbits. That's the word from residents who say the numbers on the peninsula are out of control. The infestation has taken hold over the last few weeks 
with rabbits visible in local camping grounds, on roadsides and in gardens. Residents are pinning their hopes on the release of a new strain of the rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus because they are not allowed to shoot rabbits in urban areas. Retiree Brian Todd of Hampton last month began hunting and says he could take out a thousand rabbits in a couple of weeks. They just keep breeding and breeding and they're breeding faster than anyone can kill them, you know. Moraki lawnmower operator Mark Brady says hundreds of rabbits of all shapes and sizes had devoured so much grass some areas didn't need cutting. Oh definitely the last two years I reckon it's quite noticeable there's more rabbits here. Yeah it's um, the old story of for every one you see there's ten you don't see and um, just driving around the roads you can quite often see 50 or 60 rabbits in a couple of k's you know just on the Tars Hill. I think the, the virus has lost its impact now and they're just carrying on. An application to import the new strain of the rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus has been made to the Ministry for Primary Industries and is being consulted on at present. Otago Regional Council Director of Environmental Monitoring and Operations Scott McLean says if approved the virus would be available by autumn next year. Roselle LeBone, The South Today. Last week marked exactly a year since Kaikoura was rocked by a destructive earthquake. The following news story looks at the effect the quake has had on a vulnerable species of local wildlife. Hutton's shearwaters only nest in the wild in two colonies high up in the Kaikoura mountains. The nest colonies are remote and inaccessible to humans, but they have been badly predated by wild pigs. To add to their woes, Hutton's Shearwater Charitable Trust chairperson Ted Howard says the magnitude 7.8 earthquake of last November damaged many of the birds' nesting burrows. We've got aerial surveys which show that around about 20% of their burrows simply fell away in landslides and our initial survey of 100 burrows showed that 38 of that 100 had collapsed in the earthquake. A researcher is scheduled to climb the sheer mountainsides to inspect the colonies close up and Ted Howard is concerned about what they will find. The 14th of November would have been just about the middle of the egg laying season so probably 60 to 70 percent of the birds would have been incubating eggs so they would have been in their burrows on eggs and midnight is the changeover time when one bird comes in and the other one goes out and so Probably could be anything up to 30 or 40 percent of the burrows would have had two birds in them. So from the perspective of the wild colonies it was about the worst timing that you could get. Fortunately the Trust had recently established an artificial colony for the birds to nest in which was unscathed by the earthquake. Our local colony of Hutton Shearwaters, our artificial colony just over here on the peninsula, has gone really well. It survived the earthquake without any damage. Uh, as of Sunday we'd had 65 birds return, which I think is our highest number ever. While the Hutton Shearwater remains endangered, the care taken by hard-working volunteers helps keep its demise at bay. Rudy Adrian, The South Today. Year 11 pupils at Tyree College have made the finals of an international silent film competition and are up for $2,000 in first prize money. Their three-minute film The Chase is their take on the genre inspired by the work of silent film star Buster Keaton. These young Otago filmmakers are still bouncing with excitement. They've been brushing up on their award speeches ever since they were named as one of 12 finalists in the 2017 International Youth Silent Film Festival. The Year 11 cast and crew are the only team from the South Island to make the finals. For this scene here, put the camera on the back of a truck and uh, drove it down the road. Cast member Jack McAtomney reckons Benaya has a big film future ahead of him. I think it would be a one-off for me, but I think Benaya could carry on with this, yep. The classic good guy versus bad guy tale centres on a stolen wallet in Middlemarch. We still like just a random guy's wallet and then Benaya is just a good guy and he takes it from us and we chase him all around the town and in the end he gets it right back. Everyone from grandparents and Benaya's 12 year old brother who shot the film to Middlemarch residents got involved. Got a good hand from uh, all the locals around Middlemarch, uh, very helpful. Um, 
couldn't drive on the road for for a wee bit so we could film. So so yeah, very helpful. In making the film, they chose to pay homage to silent film legend Buster Keaton, including recreating his stunts with a bit of number eight wire, of course. A rope and harness set up, so did all all the stunts were real. The stunts are replicas of what he did, and. Um, Lots of the style of camera work is the same as what they used back in 1860. On Tuesday night, the team heads up to Tauranga for the big awards ceremony and to find out if their silence spoke volumes. First prize is $2,000 and the top three entries automatically go to the world finals. But the filmmakers say they'd be happy to walk out with a new camera. Roselle LeBone, The South Today. Coming up after the break, a former Invercargill graffiti artist holds his first gallery exhibition, and the Dunedin Public Library puts on an exhibition of Christmas relics. Welcome back. A Southland-born graffiti artist has progressed from tagging Invercargill walls to his own exhibition in Riverton. Danny D. O. Owen is the first artist featured in Riverton's newly established Vault Pop-Up Gallery. Sharon Rees has more. Danny Owen has come a long way since his days of tagging trains and bridges. The graffiti artist, who works under the name Dio, no longer works illegally under the Shroud of Darkness, but instead is proudly displaying his works at the Vault Pop-Up Gallery in Riverton. I was the guy tagging Grandma's fence back in the day. Um, Painting trains and a lot of time, I spent a lot of time under bridges and kind of desolate places where people normally don't go. But um, from there to now, like it's definitely like a huge leap, you know. But it, it's like any art form, you've got to start somewhere. For us, like graffiti, you know, you've got to learn to walk before you can run. And like graffiti and tagging and illegal activity was the start of it, you know. Owen has spent much of his life in California, where he first started painting graffiti, but says over the past few years he's experimented with different media to blend his style with more traditional art forms. I feel blessed to be able to refine it into like an art form that's accepted and appreciated and purchased. You know? He believes his unique style of art is becoming more acceptable in society and will likely continue into the next generation. Most kids aren't going to go to a gallery, but they'll see street art or murals or graffiti, like quality graffiti. And for them, it, it's got to inspire them to, to be an artist, because if I had seen the stuff I see now when I was young, I'd probably be a million times better at what I do to have like influence to, to be an artist, you know. Dio's exhibition was supposed to end on Sunday, but its popularity may see it extended into December. The Vault pop-up gallery in the old Bank of New Zealand building will be hosting the works of a range of Southland artists over the next few months. Sharon Rees, The South Today. Cigarette butts, bottle caps and a pair of black bikini bottoms were just some of the rubbish picked up from the beaches of Lake Wanaka by volunteers last weekend. The clean-up was the first in Wanaka organised by Ocean Conservation Group Sea Shepherd. Every six weeks for the past two years, the organisation has run cleanups of Lake Wakatipu beaches and now it has branched out to include Lake Wanaka. About 20 volunteers picked up rubbish and there are plans to include the banks of the Clutha River in the future. Relics from Christmas Pass are being showcased at the Dunedin Public Library's Reed Gallery Heritage Christmas Exhibition. Staff at the library have been digging into the archives searching for old-fashioned highlights of the festive season. These are some of the Christmas treasures that have emerged from the Dunedin Public Library for its latest heritage exhibition. The exhibition is a look back on the Christmas annuals, magazines, children's stories, craft and cookery books of New Zealand's yesteryear. The exhibition shows a little bit, it shows the movement from the very um, Northern Hemisphere centred types of illustrations, um, you know, with snow and sleigh bells and sleighs and things like that, through to uh, the more Kiwiana type Christmas with Pohutukawa trees and things like that. Earlier material from the um, Rare Books collection includes things like um, early editions of A Christmas Carol by Dickens. So, you know, we're going back into the 19th century and right through up to pretty much the present day. 
Also on display is a collection of vintage Christmas cards. A.H. Reid collected and gave to the library and also a collection of Christmas cards that a former city librarian, Ada Fash, had collected and left in the library. And Christmas themed books are seeing the light of day again with special items from the McNabb Troopship collection. First established by um, the city librarian W.B. McEwen, just after the First World War he decided that troopship magazines were something that would disappear if nobody made the effort to collect them. So he started advertising for them and collecting them for the library and we've continued that tradition on through the Second World War. The exhibition is on until February. Roselle LeBone, The South Today. More than 5,000 people turned out over the weekend to enjoy Omaru's Victorian fate. One of the highlights was the annual World Stone Soaring Championship. Ruby Sinclair and Isa Brazil are now the World Stone Soaring Champions. They won the Parkside Quarries World Stone Soaring Junior Doubles Contest at Omaru's Victorian Fate at the weekend. The pair had some sound advice about coming out tops. It's all in the pull and not the push when it comes to soaring. First time stone soarers Lu Jiang and April Lin of Omaru said they were lucky to take out the women's title on their first go. Victorian fate coordinator Frances McMillan was pleased with the turnout at the five day fate. It's really good, we've got a lot more stalls on Tyne Street and we've got a lot of new stalls so we've got about 130 stalls this year so it's packed, it's, it's really good. The street parade at noon on Saturday featured 150 participants and hundreds of observers. The Heritage Rowing Cup was won by the ship's company from HMNZS Tauroa and crowds lined Tyne Street to watch the 23rd Heritage Cycle Championships. Roselle LeBone, The South Today. Still to come on Southern Newsweek, a 101-year-old Ranfilly resident is still motoring around town and Thornbury's Presbyterian Church faces demolition. Welcome back. A 101-year-old Ranfilly resident has just celebrated another birthday. She still drives to her daily errands and attributes her long life to a sherry every day. Bessie Pearson is completely healthy, proud to have once scored a hole in one and still drives herself to church every Sunday. She says the man upstairs isn't quite ready for her just yet. Be a good girl, lead a good life, choose a good husband, and make a good wife. The Ranfurly resident attributes her long life to good genes and a healthy dose of determination and a sherry every night. She cooks three meals a day after driving herself to the shops and still grows her own vegetables. When I go out in my car, I live down the drive and one of the neighbours goes out and backs it into the garage. <laughs> I cook I three meals a day, nearly always cook my own meal. And I like cooking, I like baking. Birthday cards from the Queen and former Prime Minister John Key still adorn Mrs Pearson's mantelpiece from her 100th birthday last year. She celebrated by having white bait for lunch with a dozen or so friends at the Ranfilly Hotel. Roselle LeBone, The South Today. Near Perfect Conditions delivered five new race records at the Queenstown International Marathon last weekend. Timaru Sam Rayford won the full marathon in record time and British national Hannah Aldred was the first woman home also in record time. Mina Amso has the details. It was a stunner of a day in Queenstown on Saturday as almost 10,000 athletes ran, jogged or walked scenic routes across Arrowtown and Queenstown. Timaru's Sam Rayford on the full Queenstown Marathon event in a record time of 2 hours 27 minutes and 56 seconds. The course is brilliant. I mean, most of it's off road, so it's really good on your legs, and the scenery is second to none. So, yeah, absolutely very enjoyable. Rayford made it to the start line despite an ear infection, and about 30 kilometres into the race, picked up the pace opening up a lead of almost five minutes over Blair McWhirter from Christchurch. Local Queenstown runner Jason Hall edged Francisco Senzana from Chile for third place in a dramatic sprint to the finish line. 
Auckland-based British national Hannah Aldroyd took the lead in the women's race inside the final 10 kilometers to win the title, beating defending champion Mel Etkin from Greymouth. <laughs> that was really, really unexpected. That was just, that was just a nice bonus for uh, a sunny day, really. Aldroyd won the women's event in the Auckland Marathon just three weeks ago. Over 1,800 marathon runners started the Queenstown event at the Millbrook Resort. However, not everybody had their sights set on being first to the finish line. British local Dan Chatterton walked the marathon in 7 hours, 32 minutes and 12 seconds in a dinosaur outfit. How are you feeling? Uh, baked. Absolutely baked. Do you need some water? I'm fine. Fine. But 5k left, this is easy. A record 9,720 people took part in the event, up from 9,500 in 2016. Mina Amso, The South Today. A Southland church will hold its last service later this month. Thornbury Presbyterian Church, 10 kilometres northeast of Riverton, is due to be demolished as maintenance issues grow and the number of churchgoers declines. When maintenance issues threatened the future of the church in the 1980s, the community rallied round to ensure its survival, rebuilding the church from its original materials. Now 36 years on, the church is again threatened with closure, but this time there's no one there to help. The same story, maintenance again, yes. It's our new old building is um, badly in need of repairs. And of course we don't have a lot of money and we don't have a lot of people so we reluctantly decided that we would be we would close. The church was established in 1878 and moved to its current location in 1903. Horrell says the decision to close the church was not taken lightly as her family's connections with the church spans generations. I've been coming here all my life. I was born in this district in Thornbury and I was um, baptised here, married here and I've been c coming to church here for all of that time and um, the generations before me of my family have been coming to this church. The parish has organised a final farewell for the church and is inviting anyone who has been involved in its long history. The 26th of November we're having a final service. We've invited ex-parishioners and friends of, the, of Thornbury and um, we hope it won't be too sad an occasion. <laughs> In future, Thornbury parishioners will attend the Isla Bank and Waimatuk churches. A date has not yet been set for the demolition. Sharon Rees, The South Today. The sport of basketball is growing in the Waitaki region thanks to the influx of basketball fans from the Philippines. The South Today went on court to find out more. It is thought there are about 500 Filipinos living in the Waitaki area most working on dairy farms. The fact that basketball is the most popular sport in the Philippines has resulted in the formation of eight teams who regularly vie it out on court in Oamaru. Duntroon-based Roel Sokido is teamed up with other members from his church and says the games are not too competitive. I mean, every team wants to win, right? But for us, it's just more on uh, just play with each other and just enjoy the game. If, 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 we, if we go on, uh, I mean, if we go on longer than on the tournament, that's a bonus. Chairwoman of Filipino Waitaki Incorporated, Lot Mortino, explains the objective is to build a community spirit amongst the resident Filipinos. We have um, goals or uh, aims to keep the Filipinos together through by ways of sports. That's number one, because um, a lot of them really like sports. Way back in the Philippines, they're active people. They like sports, music, arts, crafts, um, and some other things that in a way will uh, preserve the Filipino culture and in a way uh, share them into the community. Yeah. So basketball is one of them. Yeah. Um, because we see that you know uh, they're really into sports, <laughs> the Filipinos are really into sports yeah. um, and arts as well. This year each team has been allowed to have one Kiwi member as well, with plans for inviting more Kiwis to take part in the future. Rudy Adrian, The South Today.
The idea of establishing a toilet museum in Dunedin has been suggested by the City Council's archivist Alison Brees. The local archivist says underground toilets in the octagon will live on through old photos but are unlikely to be reintroduced in Dunedin. This 105 year old toilet in Manor Place is the last standing toilet in Dunedin. A standing toilet is, by the way, the technical term for a row of ceramic urinals. Dunedin City Council archivist Alison Brees believes this might even be the oldest standing toilet left in the country and should become a museum. We came across an amazing collection of historic photographs of all the uh, three undergrounds and the other above ground toilets, including the one behind me in um, 1919. The Manor Place toilets are slightly newer than the more famous octagon toilets. Bruce says some people want the octagon toilets brought back, but the chances aren't looking good. We've found all the specifications of them all being filled in, knocked in and filled up with rubble. Although I haven't got many reports of a lot of stuff being taken out of them, so it's possible some of the tiles may still be in the hole, so to speak. Bruce says the Octagon Toilet's reputation for depravity was justified. We've got reports of the ones in the exchange that um, had a lot of men, uh, I said paralysis of the gastric nerves is how they described it after bar treatment, was the way they described it, basically vomiting and all the rest of it, but it used to be cleaned up straight away by the attendants. The toilets were built in the Octagon for women and men in 1910, but were knocked in in 1989 as part of the Octagon redevelopment. In 1965, the men's toilets were moved to make way for the new Star Fountain. Two undergrounds shut in the 1960s in the Exchange and the uh, London Street one. And the ones underneath the Cargill's Monument in the Exchange, um, it was all part of the discussion to actually knock down the Cargill's Monument, which they didn't, thankfully. During this time, it was still considered distasteful for women to go to the toilet in public. If you were just coming for a day shopping, it was, or just running a few errands, it was kind of hard to find a toilet if you needed one. Brees is presenting a paper at Victoria University in Wellington next week on historic toilets. Roselle LeBone, The South Today. That's all from us this week. You can go online and check us out on Facebook and Twitter, or you can keep up with Southern News via our website, channel39.co.nz. I'm Melissa Barton, and thanks for watching. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand On Air.